Good morning. <laughs> that got you to move, didn't it, Jamie? <laughs> Am I loud? <laughs> Good morning on this cold morning. Uh, it's just great to see everyone come out. And uh, I don't know who had the coldest temperatures, but uh, I, I'd heard that somebody up north toward Pickford had 24 below this morning. That's cold. Are you going to ask me how cold it is? Go ahead. Well, it is so cold that the chickens are lined up in the KFC parking lot waiting for a chance to dump, jump in the deep fryer. <laughs> That's cold. <laughs> I have uh, some scripture I would like to read too just before we sing the doxology and it is from Colossians chapter 1 and in Colossians chapter 1 there are a couple of different themes that I wanted to capture this morning. The first one is God's goodness to us, the way that he has shown us enormous kindness and then the second one is Paul's sense of identity as a minister. I thought both of those would be useful. So if you would rise for the reading of the scriptures, I'm going to read two different selections out of Colossians chapter 1. And the first one starts in verse 9. Paul says to the church there in that city that since the day we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this, in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he rescued us, from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins and so from that passage we will sing the doxology but before we do i want to drop down to the end of chapter one where paul talks about his labor for the body of christ he says i have become its servant by the commission god gave me to present to you the word of god in its fullness the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end I labor struggling with all his energy, which works so powerfully in me. Number 17 in your songbook is about that very thing. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Those of you who like classical music will know the origins of this melody. A famous German composer wrote the words, and if you look in your hymn book, you'll see the name of that person if you don't know who I'm talking about. But we've decided to spice this song up in a way that reflects joy. The song is about joy, right? So we can't sing it like this. Stand up and let's sing this song together.
Have you ever taken a close look at American currency? Does, it, does anyone have a, a quarter on them this morning? I, I didn't actually bring a quarter. I, I need one here. I want to show you something on the quarter. Uh, it's actually, it's pretty much, go ahead and flip it up here, Katie. I'll try to catch it. Give it to my dad. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So uh, let's see here. Yeah, th this particular quarter uh, is, I think it's almost neat up. So it's got the Tuskegee Airmen on it. Yeah, right here on the, on the tails side of this particular quarter, right along the rim on the bottom, uh, there's a Latin phrase written. Almost every single coin has this written on it. And let me show you a picture of what that looks like up close. E pluribus unum. E pluribus unum. Any Latin speakers in the crowd that can tell me, a, we, we, if we're going to speak in tongues on a Sunday morning, we've got to have a translation. That's a biblical requirement. <laughs> Anybody translate e pluribus unum for me? Who said that? From one many, or out of the many, I heard some, someone else say, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, out of the many one, from one many. That's what that means. Uh, it, it's, it's been a, a motto for America since the 1700s, that out of the many, the many different citizens from many different nations, we've all come together. We're one nation under God. So that's the, that's the, uh, that's the coin currency. Uh, uh, let's talk about paper currency a minute. Does anyone have a $20 bill? Ron, Ron might. He's digging in there. You got one, Ron? Okay. Yeah, can I? Thank you. Now, this is, uh, there's nothing really that I want to talk about related to the $20 bill. I just, I, I put 20 bucks on my boy, Matt Stafford. And so if the Rams beat the Bengals, you'll get your money back. Just want you to know that. Okay. Oh, I just, wait. <laughs> oh my, you people. Okay, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Ephesians. We're talking about being a listening church. Let's get back up to our main splash screen up there that has been our, our reminder that we not only want to learn how to be a church, we want to be how, learn how to be a church that listens. And uh, we are finding ourselves today in part nine of this sermon series in Ephesians. And today we're going to learn a little bit less about what it means to listen, although a little bit, but we're going to primarily learn about what it means to be a church. And so Ephesians chapter 4, I'd like to start at verse number 7. So if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and open it to verse number 7. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly region? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So let's take a look at that text together. I'm going to put it up on the screen so that we can kind of take it apart a piece at a time. And we've got this conjunction phrase, but, right here leading off in verse 7. And of course, you've heard me say this to you before, and I know that a lot of you already know this. You can't just parachute into the center of a book of the Bible and expect it to make perfect sense. You have to travel from the border, which is the beginning, across its pages to get to where you are. And even though some people paratrooped in, uh, like we've done this morning, there is a lot behind this. And so we see this phrase, but to each one. And what that is all about is that in the previous 
verses of one through six, Paul is emphasizing the unity that we have in the Christian faith. You've got one body, one spirit, one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one hope, one God and Father of all. And it's like Paul's going one, 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 seven times we got, we are one people. But even though we're one, to each of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. So even in our unity, we have much diversity. And we're going to find today that in that diversity, we find that we come together and make a much better, healthier, stronger unity. In this first verse, number seven, we see not only that each of us has received grace from Christ, but that he is the one who decided who gets what. Now, in America today, in families, we are all about even. And some of you are so focused on even that you have to be within $1 of each child at Christmas or it's not even. And we have created this idea uh, sometimes that even, even some of us do this. On one child's birthday, we don't want the other kids to be sad and cry, so we give them a little something so that they're not left out because they're all saying, I want something too, I want something too, what about me? It's not fair, it's not fair. Like, well, folks, we're not out in the world trying to just get along in society. We're in here where we're seeking truth and seeking reality. And I got some reality for you this morning. Life ain't fair. Suck it up. <laughs> some of you... We're given shortness. Some of you were given height. Some of you were given big muscles. Some of you weren't given big muscles. Some of you can do math in your head automatically. Some of you have to pull out your phone and open the calculator app just to do simple addition. Some of you have a brain that you can open the hood of an engine and just look at it and it makes sense to you. Others of you open the hood to your car. You don't even know how to open the hood to your car. <laughs> Everybody's different. Some of you are so artistic that you can distinguish between magenta and fuchsia. And I don't even know how to spell either of those, really. So I don't care. With men, there's like eight colors. Blue, green, red, black, brown. But it's, we're all different, and, and these are things that have been given to you that are special for you. And Christ is the one who apportions it. And there is no place in the body of Christ to be looking around and saying, well, how come I didn't get the same thing that he got? I don't know. Take it up with the giver of gifts. It's his call. Now, let me just say a little bit more about this. Hold that thought about it's his call. Hold that thought. Because look at the next passage, the next section of this passage. It's almost, it's almost like Paul was going down a path with a certain agenda, and then he just got sidetracked for just a second, but he's going to come right back. So he says that Christ gave the gifts, right? By the way, this is why it says in Psalm 68, it doesn't say that there, but Paul's quoting Psalm 68. This is why it says in Psalm 68, 18, he ascended on high and led captives in his train and gives gifts to men. That's why it says it. So Paul is like reaching back to the Old Testament, which in Paul's day at the writing of this letter, that was the only Bible. They didn't have the New Testament at this time of this writing. Paul was alive. He's writing the New Testament. This letter would eventually become part of the New Testament. And so he's quoting from the only thing they have as holy writ, and that is the Old Testament, it happens to be Psalm 68, 18. And, and he says, this was prophesied that Jesus would give gifts to men. And what does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions, which he did. Jesus came down to earth in the form of a man. And, uh, and he uh, also the very one who ascended, right? This is, this is Jesus. He went up in heaven. Sometimes in church, we have Ascension Sunday to celebrate the fact that Jesus went up to be at the right hand of the Father. This is nothing that's brand new to us if we've been around Christianity for a a few hours. But what it is a reminder to is that he who descended, look at the text there, he who descended is the very one who ascended. How high? 
You don't get any higher. He went as high as you can possibly go, higher than all the heavens, went right through the cosmos and up to the right hand of the Father, and he fills the whole universe. Now you think about a God who is so big that earth is, Earth is a microscopic speck. And on planet Earth are these ultra-microscopic specks called you and me walking around. And we're going to stand there and say, how come you didn't to the almighty living Savior of the world? God, no, you do that if you want to. I just say thank you for whatever you did. Thank you for what you gave me. Thank you for making me who I am. Thanks for letting me be in the family. Oh, goodness, that's, I'm just so thankful for that. I'm not going to bellyache about what I don't have. I'm just so thankful for what I do have. So when Christ is the one who apportions it, that's good enough for me. This is why it says, so Paul's sidetracked. This is, let's move on here. He gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. Now, what you see here are five categories that are listed, each of those different categories representing a different kind of a gift. And I want to talk briefly about each one of those. Apostle is a special kind of office, and those people, those apostles, were personally called they were appointed and sent out by the resurrected Jesus with whom they saw and spoke. They were workers of miracles, and they were a particular set of 12 that in the Bible are referred to as the apostles. Back in chapter 2, if you've got your Bible still open and want to flip back, Chapter 2, we're told in verse 20 that God's family, God's people, members of God's household are, verse 20, built on the foundation of the apostles. That's who the apostles were. And it also says the prophets. They were built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. So who is Paul referring to here? Is he referring to just random at-large apostles who are running around? No, he's referring to Jesus' apostles. They are foundational for understanding the church. But it doesn't stop with the apostles. Don't, don't dismiss the Old Testament. It's the apostles and the prophets. And who would Paul have in mind when he says, and the prophets? Who else but Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, all 17 of them until you get to Malachi. By the way, in your Old Testament, did you know that those prophets with their books named after them, they're all stuck together there in the, side by side in the second half of the Old Testament, and they are stuck together not in the chronological order in which these men lived, but in the length of the book. So when you read Isaiah, he's the, there's got the most written, and then all the way down to Malachi, who has the least amount written. And if you try to read through them from left to right, the normal way that we read books, uh, it'll get very confusing because it bounces around historically because these guys, some of them lived with each other and some of them didn't, and they're not in order. Only in order of size. So th those are the prophets. Now the question that is asked quite a lot is, are there apostles and prophets Today, and I would say technically, yes, but not officially. Technically, yes, but not officially. So in some ways, I could say that right now I'm doing the work of a prophet. Because when we look at what the prophets did, besides just telling the future, they also told God's message. They weren't only people who foretelled, they also forthtelled. And, and told, forth told. And that, that is not futuristic. It's just God wants you to do this. God wants you to do that. This is what he says in his word. This is what we need to do. And in that sense, what I'm doing right now is kind of like a prophet. Also, uh, kind of what I'm doing now is sort of like an apostle because the word apostle actually means one who is sent. And I have been sent here to Cedarville, First Union Church, 
and I'm the interim that was sent here. So in that sense, I'm also an apostle. But it's not in any kind of official capacity. I don't have the office of an apostle. I don't have the office of prophet. Now, you could, I suppose, if you wanted to be loose about it, you could call me that. But Marsha already calls me the high, holy, reverend doctor pastor. And if we had to add prophet and apostle to that, it would get really cumbersome, wouldn't it? She, she would forget, so there's no point in adding it. So the next one in the list is evangelist. And evangelists are people who are specially gifted in the, in the, in the uh, telling of the evangel. I've, now, some of you probably didn't think about the word evangel being an actual word, but it is. The evangelist tells the evangel. In the New Testament, if you were readers of Greek, you'd be reading along and you'd get to the word gospel. And in Greek, the word gospel is evangel. We didn't have a good word for it in English, so we just brought it right over from the Greek as a transliteration. Evangel means the good news. It means the gospel. And an evangelist is one who goes around and the primary emphasis of their ministry is spreading the evangel. That's what they do. And perhaps one of the most famous of all was Billy Graham. I had a woman in my congregation a, a number of years ago. She passed away. But she came to Christ at the Maranatha conference ground on Lake Michigan when a very young man named Billy Graham, no one had ever heard of him, was speaking at this tiny little camp. And she was there as a child, a teenager, and she gave her life to Christ. And then Billy Graham became worldwide, and she's like, I know him. That's the guy who was at the camp. And that's what Billy Graham did. He spread the gospel, spread the evangel. Now, I don't think that I have the gift of evangelism, but the body of Christ has people who do. And all of us have a responsibility to share our faith, but there are some who are called specifically and that is the primary work of what they do. They are the Johnny Appleseeds of Christianity. They're just planting everywhere they go, spreading the good news of Christ. There are two more categories here. These are the ones that we are more familiar with because they're very much a part of everyday life. And that is the pastor and the teacher. There are three different words that are used in the New Testament for the word pastor and they're just used interchangeably. Sometimes those words get translated as elder. Sometimes they get translated as pastor. And sometimes they get translated as overseer. It doesn't matter which one it is. There's even a couple verses in the Bible where all three of those words are kind of punched right into the same sentence. And it just re refers back to the same person or the same office. In First Union Church, we have the office of elders. And that office is something that we've been really working hard in the last 18 months or so to try to develop it according to that which distinguishes it. Because every tool in the bag is unique. But if I'm pounding with my crescent wrench, I might drive a nail in a little but that's not what it's for. There's such, so much better ways to use the tools in the toolbox. That's the same way it is with elders. So we're working together to develop what that looks like. That's why Wayne is going to step up. Because the Bible says in Timothy and in Titus, elders need to be able to teach. And if they can't teach, then they probably shouldn't be elders. Now, don't think for a minute like, oh, so what are we going to start kicking the people off the elder board? Yeah, kind of, uh, but not really. It's like, it's like there's no kicking off. There, there's like, who are you? Well, I'm a, then that's what you should do. Why are you here? And I'll tell you why it sometimes happens that way, because it happened in my church too. You go marching along as an institution and the annual meeting comes around and we're supposed to have this many people in a certain position. And then this question gets asked, who in the world can we find to be an elder? 
we just need a warm body in there. <laughs> warm body? What do you mean a warm body? An elder is a very special gifting. You don't just stick a warm body in there. Oh my goodness, in my career, I have seen people say, well, let's, let's just pick, let's pick him because uh, he runs a good business. Oh, I see. So if you're a good businessman, you should be an elder. Well, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe. Well, let's just pick him. Well, he's 23. Why are you going to put him as an elder? Elder actually kind of means older, right? So, well, then let's pick him. He's 80. Well, I know he's 80, but he, he, he's not spiritually mature at 80. You don't want him to be leading the flock, do you? So what we're doing is we're saying, hey, look, if you're going to be an elder, that means that you are a pastor. And as First Union looks for its next elder, overseer, pastor, that person is going to be the first among equals. That person is going to be the lead elder, and the other lay elders will work with that person. Now, it's, of course, that person's got special training. That person is going to have special experiences. That person is going to have a special measure of gifts. But that person is going to be doing the work of leading the others who are elders. And if you are able to meet all the qualifications of being an elder, then p- perhaps you should become one. And if you don't have the qualifications of being an elder, that's no harm, no foul. Just go to the place where you do have the qualifications. Why would we, why would we elevate someone to a high office when they're not competent to be in that office? But we do. This is America, right? And we don't do it in the church. Oh, come on, you guys. You know what I'm talking about. We don't, we don't want to do that in the church either. So some are to be pastors. The others are teachers. And teachers, I know some teachers who are wonderful teachers, and they are not pastors. But boy, do they know. They know Hebrew. They know Greek. They, um, I have some favorites. Don Carson from uh, Trinity uh, Seminary. He's retired now, but out of Chicago. A Canadian guy, by the way, from Quebec. Uh, there's not a finer Bible scholar that I have read than D.A. Carson. He's not a pastor. Um, uh, R.C. Sproul. R.C. Sproul was on staff at a church, but he is not a pastor. And when R.C. Sproul would talk about it, he would say, I'm not gifted enough to be a pastor. And it's like, that dude's gifted. He's brilliant. He is brilliant, but he's brilliant in his own lane. That's where he's brilliant. Don't ask him to, to do the work of shepherding. Shepherding involves a little bit of teaching and preaching. It involves some other things. Um, we have had a situation already in this church where Steve Gulder was coming closer to the end of his life, and, a, and we paid visits to him. And I didn't just go. And I know a lot of people think, well, you should go. You're, that's what you're paid for, Right. You're about to find out that that ain't exactly right. But, um, but yes, I did go, but I took people with me. So one time I took Mike with me and we went and it's like, come on, Mike, we're going to go be pastors together and do ministry together. One time I took Dave with me and, and, and in that particular situation, poor Steve couldn't even get out of bed anymore. And he wanted to be in the living room on the bed in the living room. It's like, come on, Dave. And we ministered to Steve and to his family together as pastors. And yesterday, it was such a delight, Dave, to take you along to go over to see Eunice and Dell. It, it just makes so much difference as we care together for the body. So that's what pastors do. Teachers are kind of special in that they're mostly, they're mostly about information and learning and knowledge. And, and, and so they, they have a special lane. Sometimes the pastor can slide into the teacher lane, sometimes they don't slide as well into the teacher lane. You'll find out next week when Wayne preaches. Uh, but I'll tell you what, you're not going to find a man who's more caring, who's going to drop what he's doing and get over to your house when there's a need. This man will shepherd this flock along with the rest of the elders. And, and he'll take a turn doing some preaching too if he needs to. But that's why, that's why you saw uh, Greg preach. That's why you've seen Mike Davis preach. That's why we're all kind of, we're kind of figuring out how this whole group needs to fit together as we, as we advance. There are a couple other Bible passages. I want to show you real quickly. Go, to, go in your Bibles to 1 Peter 4. 1 Peter 4, verses 10 and 11 is another example where we see this idea of multi-dimensional gifts all working together for a singular objective. 
So we've got 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11. Each one, each should use whatever gift he has received to serve others. What's your gift, Jacob? You use it to serve. What's your gift, Debbie? You use it to serve. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. So you have the ability to administer an aspect of God's grace that I can't even come close to. And when you're doing it and I'm doing it and we're all doing it, it's going all different directions around this place, not just on a Sunday morning at 1030, but all week long, that grace is flying around and we're using our gifts. That's beautiful. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. And you must do it with the strength that God provides so that in all things, God might be praised through Christ Jesus. The other passage is 1 Corinthians, chapter 12, or 1 Corinthians 12, and in that chapter is probably one of the consummate chapters on spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God who works all of them in all people. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. So each one of us, the spirit has, it comes and indwells us at our salvation and we are useful to each other for mutual benefit, the common good. To one there is given through the gift, the spirit, a message of wisdom, another a message of knowledge. And this isn't an exhaustive list, but there's all kinds of different gifts. But one giver of gifts, one church, one God. Now back to our text here. It was he who gave some to be apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, teachers. This particular selection of gifts are the people who are the leaders. They are the, primarily the leaders within the church. The apostles and prophets were the leaders of God's people during their day. Now we've got evangelists, pastors, and teachers who are predominantly the leaders today. And have you ever been in a situation where there were a lot of chiefs but not enough Indians? That could be tough. Each person has to find where they fit. And when we figure that out, then we can start working together in this kind of this, uh, like a symbiotic relationship. Uh, like, let's go back to the car engine. You open it up and there's all kinds of parts and pieces. Some are big, some are electrical, some are mechanical. But when they're all working together and they're all doing their part and that engine is firing on all cylinders, then we use it to get to the grocery store. It works the way it's supposed to. And that's the way we are together together working. But the leaders, what are the leaders for? What are, specifically, what are the pastors and teachers for? To prepare God's people for works of service. You see, you thought for a minute that you were paying me so that I'd go do it, right? That's not it. Do you know what you're paying your pastor for? To train you. That's what you're paying the pastor for, to come alongside of you and say, who are you? How do you want to serve? What gives you the fizz? What is it that the Spirit has gifted you to do that no one else can do? Let's figure this out. Let's start some ministry. Let's, let's do whatever. We, we're not program-driven. We're people-driven, and it's each individual person, what you can do, and what do you love, and what, do you, what are your skills? And That's the job of the pastor, to prepare God's people for works of service. And I'll tell you what, the church in America today is... We've got this backwards. We've turned into a spectator event where you come in and sit in rows and we have someone who, who's good at music and they do their gift and someone else who's good at talking and that person does their gift and everyone else does no other gifts on a Sunday morning. You just come in, you watch, then you go. The text does not say that pastors are preparing services for people. It says it's preparing people for service. First time I walked into a church one time, I thought, man, this is like the Jamie Nichols show. And I, and I, said, to, I said to the board, I said, you know, I, I'm like doing everything. Somebody, we could have people read scripture and lead songs. And, and, and uh, the message was, why? That's what you're for. And sometimes when you start thinking about who the next pastor at First Union should be, you're thinking about it from a spectator perspective. You're thinking, is that, is that a talker I could sit and listen to every week or not? 
What you, that's no. That's not the question. The question is, can this person help me to grow in my faith to become everything I need to be to the glory of God? We, as pastors and teachers and the elders of this church, our job is to prepare you for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. We got to grow, we got to develop, we got to build, we got to work at it. And the pastor's job is to help coach that process. Are you glad that you're part of the family of God? Because we sing that song. We're going to sing it right now again, Joni. Or are you glad you attend the First Union religious program for an hour? And it's kind of entertaining because the pastor steals money from teenagers and <laughs> makes funny jokes with the children and it's all cute and cool. Is, that's, I hope that's not why any of you are here. I hope you're here so that you can be strengthened to go out from here and do the work that God has called you to do. So that you can serve according to your gifts, administering God's grace in its various forms. Let's stand together and let's sing, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. say this church is not going to grow because we get a better talker up here because we get cooler musicians up here the church will grow when you do your jobs out in the community and the people start coming in because they've experienced the grace of God in its various forms let's pray father in heaven work in us and bring us to maturity in Christ that we might be able to be one with him in a way that that he pours through us as we, as all of us together, the hands and the feet of Jesus in this community, use us toward that end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.